Aloha, welcome to Condo Insider. It's Thursday, it's our weekly show about association living. Uh, we have about 38% of our population lives in a condo in Hawaii. And this show is for board members and owners and interested people alike in condo living. And you know, I have a little reprieve for you today because for the last couple, three or four weeks, we've been emphasizing the legislature. So the next show is coming up, are gonna be on new topics. And one of my pet peeves has always been, I've harped on this over and over again, is who is responsible for what in the condo when it comes to insurance? So I've invited a good friend of mine, Tom Roselli, who's the property manager, property claim supervisor for First Insurance here, and we're going to get to the bottom line on this. So, Tom, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Richard. Yep. Tell us a little about you, your background, and your company, and briefly for our topic today. Sure. My name is Tom Roselli. I've been in the insurance industry for 20 years, 15 as an adjuster, five as a producer selling policies. I moved to Hawaii in 2005. I started First Insurance in 2011. Um, first Insurance, we have our name because we were the first insurance company in Hawaii. We've been around since 1911. We're the oldest carrier in the state. We're also the largest carrier in the state. So I kid about this. like. We don't have any condo claims, do we? Do we have claims? No, my entire staff is just waiting at the phone for something to happen. You know, but the truth is, how about how many claims a year do you process? Uh, our department usually ha handles around 4,000 claims a year, and that's first party property damage. So that's quite a few. It's a lot. And so what is the average value of a claim? So uh, the claims, the majority of the claims that are filed, about 68% of the claims we handle are water losses. And then, uh, depending on the year, it could be wind or theft claims. Um, fires also are um, not as frequent as, as water, but obviously they have a lot more severity and, and are impactful. The average severity for, say, an average water loss is, is anywhere from eight to $10,000. So here's a trick question. Are there more fire claims a year or more sprinkler heads that break water claims a year? <laughs> uh, there are a lot of, of sprinklers that cause damages, whether it's somebody trying to hang a coat on a sprinkler head or the actual plumbing uh, failing in some way. And that can be pretty expensive, right? It's very expensive. And if an elevator got involved, what's, what's that worth in general terms? Uh, after having to pump out the pit and deal with all of the electronics and things like that, um, anywhere from $150,000 to $300,000. Wow. Yeah. Well, anyway, let's talk about my pet peeve. I hear it all the time where a board member says, oh, there's a water leak in the unit. Mm. Tell the owner to go file with their HO6 policy. Sure. Is that the right answer? Well, the master policy or the, the associations are bound to carry insurance to cover the building. So every association has a master policy which covers the building. And in the conditions of that policy, that states that that policy is primi primary over any other insurance. Conversely, individual unit owners who have what are called an HO6 or a condominium unit owner's policy, the conditions of their policy specifically state that that policy is excess over any insurance in the name of an association or, or corporation. So the bottom line is, is if you have water damage or you have damage to a condominium, the master policy is primary for that damage and then the unit owners is, is secondary or excess over the AOAO's policy for dwelling coverage. Now, obviously the HO6 or the unit owner's policy is gonna be primary for their loss of use or for their personal property, which the association has no insurable interest in. But if you're talking about building or, or, or you know, building damage, yes, the AOAO policy is primary. What happens if an owner, for example, decided to replace their kitchen and put all new COA cabinets in and sub-zero appliances and upgraded their kitchen. Is that covered under the master or is that the HO6? So the master policy, again, how you settle the claim is, is defined by the policy itself. And most policies are a standard ISO policy um, that covers the building. The bylaws also then kind of um, uh, dictate what is covered under the uh, master policy. And the bylaws in most cases are going to state that the association policy must bring the building back to its original conveyance or as planned. 
So basically what it is, is is commonly referred to as as built. So if the building was built in 1971 with plywood box cabinets, Formica countertops, shag carpet, um, VCT tiles, popcorn ceilings, and if you have direct physical damage to the unit, the association policy is is um, required to indemnify, meaning monetarily compensate the AOAO for plywood boxes, for mica countertops, the as-built. Now, if somewhere along the line, it's been upgraded to granite, COA, um, wallpaper, wall-to-wall -wall mirrors, those would be considered upgrades or, or improvements, and that would be then the responsibility of the individual unit owner's policy. Walk me through, let's say, keep it to a simple claim. Sure. So you have a pipe that breaks in a, in a unit, mm. and the pipe happens to service only that unit. Mm. What should owners and property managers do now they have a water claim? You're going to have certainly the mitigation issue of getting the water cleaned up. You're going to have the claim issue. What steps should they take once they see they have a potential claim? Well, as soon as a claim happens, immediately you should notify your property manager or your resident manager, make them aware of what's going on. The resident manager, property manager, again, because the, the master policy is primary, they should take steps to mitigate the damages, bring in a company to, to dry it out, get rid of the water, prohibit any kind of mold growth or some issues from that unit spreading into common areas or, or the neighbors. Um, and then uh, notify your insurance company. And after the mitigation is complete, you get an estimate for the repairs. If the loss is below the association's deductible, as a result of 514B, uh, which is a, a statute regarding the, the condominium regimes, associations now have the ability of either assessing what they're paying for those damages that are below their deductible, um, or they can assess the deductible to the unit of origin regardless of fault, uh, or they can prorate it amongst all of the other units that were affected. So in your scenario, a pipe leaks. It doesn't matter whether it services one unit, multiple units, um, it could be somebody tipped over a garbage can. You have water damage. Water damage is covered under a, a master policy. So you would have a claim under your AOAO policy. And just because it may not exceed the deductible doesn't mean it's not covered. Um, but the unit owner should notify the resident manager and, and the building so that they can go ahead and either take steps to hire somebody or, or bring in in-house guys to dry it. Put together an estimate for the repairs. And then if the total damages are less than the deductible, then... They can either the AOA will pay it under their you know out of their general fund, or they can use the avenues within 514B to assess the deductible to the unit affected. Uh, in which case, since the AOA policy is not paying anything, now the HO6 becomes excess, and their policy should take care of, of the yeah, damages. Because my recollection of this, and uh, I, I'm not an insurance guy, so I may not say it accurately, is that you go. I've been around a long time. Sure. When I go back and I look at originally condos, they all had like $1,000, $1,500, $500 deductibles. Mm -hmm. And when you think about it practically, that means the insurer for the building, the master policy, was taking the risk of all these water claims. So what we saw happen over time is the deductibles started going to 5000 10000 20000 right. to keep the premium as low because certainly the insurer, he was taking all that risk of $1,000 and he knew the buildings were getting older and really bumped the, the policy. And the associations took the, or the industry took the position, we're better off having that deductible, let's say $10,000, sure. being insured by the unit owner, because typically in a building, you have a whole bunch of different insurers, so not one insurer is taking the risk for the whole building. You know, it's, it's, you've kind of mitigated and spread the risk. Is, sure. Is there any truth to my thinking? Or? Well, I, I think there's a lot of truth to it. I think that, you know, when associations were doing reserve studies and they needed to figure out how much money they were going to set aside for claims, um, because, again, the traditional way was the deductible is the amount that you self-insure. And as these buildings became you know, into deferred maintenance or, or issues started coming up with as the buildings were aging out, you know, you could assume that you were going to have, say, five claims a year, and suddenly you had buildings that we're having five claims in the first quarter, right? And so now you're tapping into your reserves for all these deductibles. So yeah, you raise the, the, the deductible, the AOAO assumes more of the risk to help keep the premiums down, and the higher the deductible, then more of these, these smaller claims um, you know, were being pushed back on the unit owners. Now the unintended consequences are, 
it's getting harder and harder to get a unit owner policy because they've always been priced that, well, if the guy upstairs leaks, you can just go after him for the damages, or you're only going to be on the hook for improvements. Those policies were never really priced to assume the full risk of, of the damages within your unit, both for the as built and the potential of upgrades. So you're saying their rates are rising or they're not issuing those policies anymore? Uh, it, well, it's a combination of both. They're becoming um, much uh, underwritten, much more strictly. So you'll see that there's a lot of people who, if you have two claims within three years, it's difficult to get insurance. Uh, the rates are coming up to reflect the fact that HO6 policies are no longer just for improvements. They're now expected to assume both the as-built and the improvements if the claim is below 15 or, or 10 or, or $25,000 as these deductibles on the AOAOs continue to go up. But going back to this initial comment I made that the primary policy, the master, is the association. Yes. The excess is the unit owner. Right. So as soon as you have a claim, the property manager, the board should report the claim to their agent. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, the owner should also report their claim to the excess carrier, and you guys will sort out who's responsible for what. Correct. And in most cases, you know, again, the AOAO adjuster is going to determine what the as-built was. And then, you know, so again, to your point, a pipe first, very common people somewhere along the line, it may not even be the owner who owns it now, but somewhere along the line, laminate wood flooring was put in. So the AOAO policy, at least from, for first insurance, if carpet was originally there, we're going to pay for the cost of replacing carpet, right? And then the difference of the carpet and the laminate wood floor would fall under the HO6 for the improvement. Now, some carriers will say that if the carpet is gone, the as-built is no longer there. They won't even pay for carpet because the carpet's not there. It's only laminate wood flooring. Right. So, but one thing boards should not do is shine on the owner and say, it's your problem and not report it to their, their carrier. No, because again, they have a fiduciary responsibility to maintain the building. And as you get into a back and forth, um, you know, the unit owner is you know, adamant that it's not their fault. The AOAO is adamant that it's not their fault. All this does is just make the situation fester, and what may have been a four or $5,000 claim now becomes something much more serious because you start getting mold growth, you start getting things that are migrating, and now you've got multiple units that are affected as opposed to just getting in some fans and dehumidifiers. After this question, we're going to take a break, but okay. what if the unit owner doesn't have an HO6 policy? Well, again, my understanding is, is with 514B, associations can vote to make it mandatory for HO6s to have insurance and provide proof of insurance, otherwise they can um, purchase it and assess it to the unit owner for not having uh, insurance. And but, you're correct that the 514B allows the board to purchase on behalf of the owner the HO6 policy if they haven't provided proof of insurance and charge it back to the owners because associations rely on the owner having the HO6 policy in part to cover the deductible as well as uh, some other incidental type claims that are there. So on that note, we're gonna take a one minute break. We'll be right back with Tom and talk about some more on insurance. Aloha, this is Scott Perry, and I'm the host of Let's Talk Hawaii at Think Tech Hawaii. In this show, we're going to be speaking in English and Japanese, and I'm gonna use my 30 years of experience to help many Japanese viewers improve their English skills, as well as learning many interesting things about Hawaii. You can catch my show every other Tuesday, 3 p.m. Hawaii time. See you then. Aloha, my name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. Law Across the Sea is on Think Tech Hawaii every other Monday at 11 a.m. Please join me where my guests talk about law topics and ideas and music and Hawaiiana all across the sea from Hawaii and back again. Aloha. Aloha, welcome back to Con uh, Condo Insider with Tom Roselli. Uh, property claim supervisor for First Insurance. And before the break, we were talking briefly about HO6 policies and the master policy. And I asked him the question, what if the owner doesn't have an HO6 policy? What if the owner has a tenant? 
I think it's very important that an owner, if it is an investment property and they are renting it out, uh, they should make the tenant have renter's insurance. Again, protect the owner against any liability that arises out of the, their unit. You know, if the tenant lets the tub overflow, you know, in many cases they'll go after the owner because they own the, the building or they own the unit when it's actually the tenant who, who caused the, the damage. And both renter's insurance and condominium, the HO6 policies, are very competitively priced. I mean, you can get a renter's policy for less than $100 a year, and condo policies are anywhere from, you know, two to $300 a year. So an owner or landlord could put in his lease, provide proof of insurance for a tenant policy and make that a I'm, obligation of, uh, of the lease. I'm not an attorney, so I can't say that, but I, I think that it would be a good idea to, to make sure that uh, they have renter's insurance, especially if they have pets. Well, I'm not an attorney either, but I'm a real estate broker. All right. And I can tell you that they certainly have the right to put within the lease a special condition requiring them to provide a reasonable tenant policy and, um, and to provide proof of insurance. I think that that would be very help appropriate. Help mitigate that. You know what? Uh, sometimes I have people talk to me about this. They get confused between what I'm going to call the deductible and a loss assessment. Sure. Tell us the difference. Well, there's, there's several assessments that an association can levy against or, or on the, the community. Uh, so um, you have coverage in, in most HO6 policies for loss assessment coverage. And the intent of the loss assessment coverage is if there's an assessment made against the entire community uh, for property owned by the entire community as a result of a covered cause of loss. So an example of that would be if for some reason the building isn't insured 80% of value, so there's some in, uninsured um, uh, exposure, or there's a lawsuit in which the association loses and, and the judgment isn't covered by insurance, and so there's a, an assessment for the, the balance of the uninsured, and every associate or every member gets assessed, that would be a loss assessment. There's assessments where, hey, the building's 20 years old, we're going to paint it, now everybody's going to get assessed $1,000. That's not a loss assessment. That's a, a special assessment for, for maintenance reasons, and it's not as a result of a covered cause of loss. And the assessment of a deductible as a result of 514B kind of falls within that guidelines of a special assessment. It's being made directly to an owner uh, or owners that are affected, not the general community at, at large. So um, some carriers will not honor uh, loss assessment coverage under their policy for the assessment of a deductible. But they will take care of it for, you know, if the, you are assessed the deductible, which creates a shortage for the damages in your unit, you have coverage under your own policy for the dwelling. And if the assessment is made for a shortage created to others, let's say you have no damage to your unit, but you flood everybody below you, uh, and there's a $50,000 deductible and nobody gets paid down below, you get assessed the deductible, you could file a general liability claim under your policy to pay the AO to make the people whole um, because of contractual liability. Another word I hear all the time when talking to uh, owners or policy holders, uh, that they, uh, I think, are confused on is uh, we know that the primary insurance is the association mm -hmm. and the excess is the unit owner. We hear this word subrogation all the time. Sure. What does that mean and how does that work? So subrogation is, is the um, going after the legally responsible party for reimbursement of funds, right? Um, and a major misconception is, is just because you own the unit, the water came from above, they're obviously responsible, they should pay for everything, right? General liability, uh, rules of general liability are you either set in motion an unbroken chain of events that results in somebody's property damage or bodily injury, or your negligence results in property damage or bodily injury. So if you're lying in bed at two o'clock in the morning, or this is a vacation rental and you're not even at the unit, you can't be held liable for the damages that arise out of your unit. Um, just because a pipe burst in the wall, right? The other thing about subrogation is a lot of associations have adopted in their bylaws what are called waivers of subrogation, meaning that the AOAO cannot go after unit owners and unit owners cannot go after the AOAO or each other in the event of a loss. Again, the intent being everybody has their own insurance. You just file a claim through your own carrier or the AOAO take care of it under their master policy. Um, but Subrogation, you know, going after somebody for being liable for your damages is very difficult in a condominium environment. But that's different than reimbursement. So if you have a situation where you're not the unit of origin 
you've been leaked upon, you file a claim through your own carrier and the carrier pays for some damages that fall under the as-built portion, well, that still is primary to the AOAO. So that carrier can seek reimbursement from the AOAO carrier or from the AOAO saying, hey, we paid for these damages that you are primary for. And the AOAO can come back and say, well, it doesn't exceed the deductible, so we're not going to file a claim. And that's not what we're asking. We're just saying, okay, well, then follow your bylaws, assess the as-built to the unit of origin, and then get that money and then reimburse us for paying for you know, the as-built or, or that which is the responsibility of the AOAO. One of the things you mentioned that I want to <coughs> emphasize, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that people misunderstand sometimes that when you have property insurance, it's for perils. Fire, wind, mm -hmm. you know, depending whether you're in a flood zone, you might have national flood insurance. Mm -hmm. It isn't for poor maintenance. Well, to your point, yes. Um, most policies are, are in some cases, um, the HO6 policies are named perils, meaning that it has to be one of these named things that, that happen, fire, lightning, theft, uh, overflow, or discharge of water. But most policies nowadays are what are called special form policies, meaning anything that happens is specific or is covered unless it's specifically excluded. So instead of trying to define everything that could be covered, they basically have now said everything is covered. We're going to define the exclusions, what we don't want to cover. And you're correct. One of the exclusions in all policies refer to age, wear and tear, deterioration, maintenance. So yes, the intent is, is that your window so, is 70 so years old. So if they failed to maintain the roof, for example, and the roof leaked, it's not probably covered then. The roof may not be, but the leak probably would. Okay. So that's interesting. So let's look very briefly at, again, uh, reviewing uh, the claims handling and what to do if you have a claim. Who can you talk to? Who can't you talk to? How do you expedite a claim? Uh, if you're a unit owner, and remember, it's under the master's policy, and they're, and they're not the owner of the policy, the association is. Right. Well, how does that all fit together? So, you know, the number one myth is, is that if it, if it happened in the unit, it's the unit owner's responsibility. No. The AOAO policy and the, you know, or first party claims is not about fault. It's about what is covered. And the building is covered and you have water damage, which is not specifically excluded. The AOAO policy is primary. So it doesn't matter. Like I said, it could be an overflow of a tub. It could be a pipe that bursts. It could be somebody that filled up a 50 gallon trash can and leaned it against the door, knocked and it, you know, it was a prank, right? That's all still gonna be primary under the AOAO and you need to file it through the AOAO. The worst thing that an AOAO can do is, is when somebody reports a claim, say, well, it's not above the deductible, we're not gonna do anything about it, and then they let it fester. And they don't bring in mitigation companies to go ahead and dry it out. Um, another you know, uh, mistake that a lot of AOAOs do is, you know, you know who your insurance carrier is. Your carrier is going to work with specific vendors or may have agreements with certain vendors. Find out who they are, and those are the guys that you should bring in. And then you basically now are, are expediting the claim because you have a vendor that your insurance company is comfortable with and is vetted, and you're not going to have to worry about you get a big bill or an invoice for the repairs, and then, um, you know, the insurance company is only willing to pay a certain amount. But as you said earlier, I think, you have that claim. They bring in the mitigation company, and it's a small claim. So the total is four thousand. The board can assess the owner for that four thousand dollars. If it's below the deductible, and that is the unit of origin, yes. So uh, you, you can't stick your head in the sand on these things. You've got to be notifying your agent, personal as well as the association, and boards should not just be saying it's not my problem. It happened in your unit. Right. Because under the statute and, and under the insurance policy, these are covered claims and owners pay maintenance fees and they're entitled to all the benefits of that policy Correct. by the fact they're paying for their share by paying their maintenance fees in that. But we're getting close to the end of our show. So you and I talked about the four myths yep. of, of insurance. So myth number one was unit plumbing. Okay, let's go through them real quickly. Sure. So uh, actually, um, common myths uh, are um, if a loss comes from a unit plumbing source, it is not the AO's responsibility. That's false. Unit owners need to contact the adjuster to find out what's going on. No. 
If I insure the AOAO, the AOAO is my client. I cannot give out information to parties who are not involved with the claim. Um, oh, it's also a condition of a policy that the insured, in this case the association, must provide access so that we can do inspections, right? Um, if the damages are below the deductible, the loss is not covered. False. It is covered. It just doesn't exceed what self-insuring responsibility is or, or what the uh, self-insured uh, amount, the deductible that the association. And then finally, the repairs must be done by a licensed contractor. While we fully uh, encourage that you use somebody who's licensed and bonded, and it may be in the bylaws that you have to use a licensed and bonded contractor, it is not a stipulation of an insurance policy. Our obligation to our insured is to monetarily compensate them for the value of the damages. What you do with the money is up to you. It's interesting. I was attending the uh, Train the Trainer course for the Real Estate Commission today, and, and one of the things that came up was aiding and abetting on licensed contractors. And management companies can very easily uh, be fined as well as forced to reimburse the association yeah. if they use an unlicensed contractor. And, and as we've discussed on the show, that law is changing if the governor signs it on what those limits are for handyman, but you got to use licensed people, particularly with electrical and plumbing. Absolutely. You know, there's just there's no excuse not to do it, and you expose yourself to a lot of risk if if you don't do it. I agree. Do you have any final thoughts? Um, no. <laughs> just you know, it, the best thing that you can do is continue to maintain your buildings. You know, paint them when they need to be painted, replace the windows as they need to be replaced. I know that a lot of associations are being proactive and they're finally getting around to replacing vent stacks and, and, and drain lines, uh, which has been a huge deal. Um, you know, I know that fire suppression, um, you know, alarms and, and sprinklers have been in the news. And so uh, I think, you know, we'll start seeing what happens as these buildings become sprinkled. Well, I want to thank you for being here today. Next week, our show is going to be property manager versus managing agent. I get all the time people saying, well, we have a property manager, we have a property manager. Well, you probably have a managing agent, and there are big differences between the responsibilities, and oftentimes it's dictated by a specific scope of work under contract with the association. You may have a managing agent that only has collecting, the end, collecting and paying the bills, for example, collecting the maintenance fees and paying the bills. We're going to have an uh, excellent association industry representative talking about managing agent versus property managers. I want to thank Tom and First Insurance for all they do in the community. Thank and you. we thank you all for watching Condo Insider. And we will see you again next Thursday at 3 o'clock. Aloha.